today within the context of we have this discussion and a lot of times even in your history books you'll see we're a two-party system right we want to qualify that with um, I'm not an anti-party person right any more than I don't think businesses should have monopolies right because the best way to encourage a competitive economy is to not have monopolies is that I'm not against the parties per se but the question we should ask are we a two-party system at all costs and is the rules of the game develop if we're going to have a two-party system a two-party system that has what purpose at the end so um, I generally like to lead some of this off with some questions but I want to emphasize that I don't really have a direction you'll notice I don't have a script I'm not trying to go out and, and tell you of you know what I think it's you guys have been doing a lot of studying in this space I don't have the full picture of what you guys have studied this year or what questions you have but I'm hoping that I can start asking questions go through some of the things we do but like this will be fun and I think it'll go go faster for all of us frankly if challenge me you think I'm saying something that's BS or you have a different perspective or whatever it is raise your hand challenge me um, if you have a question about something related to the space you think I might be able to answer I'll do my best or I'll BS my way through an answer but um, but in seriousness like let's let's talk about um, the situation we are today um, at a fundamental level, what Stephanie does, what Kaya does, what I do, you've seen the, the third thing on what Independent Voter Project um, does is educating people about the election process and the conditions we are today because it's our belief that that's the first step to start making changes is the people to step outside of the news narrative of what's going on and realize the system that exists. And once we have that level of education, then collectively we can move to change it so before I get into those questions just a little bit of background independent voter project started in 2006 um, in full disclosure my father was one of the founding members he was a former Democratic legislator um, one of his co-founders was a Republican legislator that had basically seen the direction of government going to a place where it's more and more partisan right and almost now it's axiomatic you go and you look at politics and your your idea of government is a battle between the Democratic and Republican Party. You can say the first thing from the, and I've been blessed to have the perspective of met mentors who really got me into thinking about this is that asking the question, well, what is the purpose of government? Is it to champion your ideas and stomp on people that disagree with you? Or is the purpose of government itself to recognize the reason we need a government is because we all have differences and this is the place where we go and say here's the pie we're dealing with here's the disagreements we have <coughs> we resolve those and start increasing the pie for everybody so that everybody feels better that they may not have gotten everything but we've put together a plan that's going to make the circumstances and the pies bigger for everybody right so and with that framing you know our independent voter projects one of their first mission was they were in those individuals involved were involved in the first iteration of opening up California's primaries it got shut down by the Supreme Court in 2006 they formed by 2010 California had changed its election system from a traditional party primary <clears throat> to one that is now a nonpartisan primary and we'll get into the details hopefully based on the questions you ask but in the context of election reform and politics, it's, it's revolutionary, it's monumental that you're able to essentially the voters take away a significant part of their election process back for themselves. Um, but um, skipping forward to where we are today, part of the reason I'm here and part of the reason IVP is still going is that there's a lot of work to do. There's people trying to do this in other states and they get shut down um, and for a variety of reasons. Um, but it all comes back to, you know, there's an opportunity to reform the process. It's really difficult, and let's start by really understanding it. Hopefully we can grow the number of people that are aware of the landscape and the opportunities to change it. So that's my opening spiel. The first question I'll ask is, you don't have to answer it if you don't feel comfortable. How many of people feel like, you know, they prefer the Republican Party? There's no right or wrong answer. If you're, if 
you were forced to choose, would you be a Republican? Well, we got one, that's good. Um, we used to, he, he used to be more. <laughs> so, uh, what about Democrats? All right. Who thinks they're independent? All right. there's, a, there's a decent balance. You're gonna have to hold your own over there. Um, but, um, so the first question, you know, there is, okay, did anybody have a feeling about somebody's good nature or any difference now that you found something out? Do you just presume that there's an Ill, Ill nature from anybody that raised their hand by virtue of what party they may prefer? Does any, I mean, you guys can say yes, no, or nothing at all. I was <laughs> I think if you start from the presumption in this context that people are Republicans or Democrats or independents because there's some grounding in their belief that that's the that they hold the ideals for the best way forward, you should start by looking at the system is that it's not about the party or what the the brand's um, perception is by the voter or what one party has painted the motives of the other party as, but that the people involved in the party are genuinely good. And if that's the case, why would we have a situation that we just keep demonizing the other two sides? That comes back to the next question is, who do, do you guys think there's too much money in politics? Yes. I see your heads shaking. How about, how many, how many people think there's too much private corporations in politics? Private corporations have way too much influence in politics. How many people think that elections should be public activities? They should serve the public. How many people think elections should serve private interests? Think elections should serve private interests? They should serve both interests. Okay, that's good. Um, so, the first question I'll ask, that's, uh, this isn't the first question, the first question I'll ask related directly to political parties and thinking about how elections work is, are political parties public organizations or are they private organizations? So, uh, political organizations are, parties are private organizations, technically. So, so if you think about money in politics, that's right. If you think about money in politics, who are the, two, who are the most powerful private corporations in the world when it comes to politics? the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, right? So whenever you see a leadership in the Democratic Party or the leadership in the Republican Party saying how much they want to get private money out of politics, right? They never inform the voter that they're the leadership of a private organization, right? So I don't know how many of you followed the Bernie Sanders campaign, right? Did, did any of you follow the the turmoil between the Bernie Sanders supporters and the Democratic National Party. Remember, the Democratic Party public narrative is they're the great protectors of voting rights, right? Did any of you, did any of you follow that? Well, the, to what, in what respect? Like, so like on the ground, like supporters to supporters, or are you talking about like everything from the super delegates to accusations that they weren't informing certain voters to show up at the polls, and that they weren't, they were using voter data for the benefit of one campaign and not for the benefit of another when the party's supposed to provide a neutral ground for all their candidates. Right? As it relates to that, and just think about this argument, okay? and I'm, this is totally agnostic. I'm not a Bernie Sanders supporter any more than I am a Donald Trump supporter or Hillary Clinton or anybody. This is just there's a matter of the field, the game that exists. Bernie Sanders supporters went to a court, a federal court, and said, this is a fraud on me. You, you lied to me. You said if I was a member, my, I would be treated equally. Your rules say you're going to treat everybody fairly. And you know what? You did this to my candidate. You did this to our voters. You did all this. Does anybody know what the argument made by the Democratic Party in, in that case was? And what the resolution in that case was? Why are you coming to a state court to tell us, a private party, how we run our party? And you know what? If we want to change the rules, we get to change the rules. 
You know what the court said? Yeah, you're right. You're right. So how does the state protect the public nature of that process if the private organization in control has insulated itself from oversight by the people by simply asserting its private right of association. Now there's two ways you can approach it. You can say that's that's crap, we should socialize the Democratic Party and make it a part of the government and then the state can get involved in, and, and maintain fairness. Or you can say, well what are the constructs of the system that gave this private organization such an inordinate power over the election process and how can we use the state apparatus to fix the rules to ensure better competition so if voters in the Democratic Party don't think its party is, ex is adequately representing the voters or is the democratic machine that it says it is, a democracy machine it says it is, that a new party could form or another competition can exist in order to challenge it. You had a question? Um, I, it seemed like something, maybe one of the conversations that may have been going on in the Democratic Party at the time was the idea that if they continued to let Bernie Sanders run and be popular, you know, he was, there was a groundswell of support for him, that they would end up basically splitting the Democratic vote, and that the political ideology that would then be elected would be diametrically opposed to both Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Right. Like, you know, Donald Trump would be elected by a vast majority if they split the Democratic vote. And then you've got someone that neither of them wanted. Right. And the culmination of that standing up, of independent voters standing up, basically resulted in the exact opposite of what they would have wanted. Right. So how does that, like, I, because I agree that it was, that it's, un, that it's ridiculous, unfair, but how do we reconcile that as someone who, if an independent party ideologically aligns closer to one than another, how do you choose whether or not, you know, how would you, like, how does that work, do you think? Well, right now, because you only have two choices, right? Right. And so I think the argument you're making is one of the rationales why it should be a private organization, right? These the parties are important vehicles for change. And part of the reason you have leadership and you have the party apparatus is because these are people who, because they're not the ones going and working at other jobs and focused on other things in their life, right, might have a higher sense uh, than the general public who's just asked to, you know, follow along and participate on election day, that, you know, where is the direction of our party going? What, what kind of person can actually win, right? To make those decisions that in a purely, you know, for lack of a better term, socialized world, if the party socialized where, and it did follow a pure democracy model, maybe that's not best for decision making for the party, right? Um, so the question I was going to okay, what does an independent voter do, right? Well, if you saw in the video when we alluded to primaries, primaries developed really around what they call the progressive era, right? So a little over a hundred years ago, and it happened fast. And what was the what was the grievance before we had primary elections? What was the grievance that led to it? Yeah. Political machines. Political machines that did what? Corruption, backroom deals, right? Lack of transparency is, you know, party leadership, you know, just picking winners and losers. There wasn't any real, and so the elections weren't serving him. The people. The people, right? So we had the progressive, and they said, you know what? We're going to put these in the public spotlight, right? And it happened really fast. Almost every state went and adopted primaries, right? And it was really a compromise between. The leadership of the of the private organizations, the parties, and the people who are ready to revolt because they're saying these private organizations have monopolized this. They're corrupt. They're not transparent. The parties and the election process that belongs the process belongs to the public isn't serving them. The compromise, okay, we're going to put our process out here in the open, right? But they did maintain the private nature. Of, of the parties and, and themselves, right? So the whole time there, there is, what's the proper balance between respecting that these vehicles, these party apparatuses to be best and serve best and also reflect the people? Like what is, where's the balance? Where does the state have control and where can the party um, say that, no, this is our right as a private organization?
So, can you talk a little? Can you use the example of New Jersey? Yeah. I mean, it, it, so the video talked a little bit about it, but put this up. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know you know. Sometimes a little I write bit on the board. It doesn't even make sense, but it makes me feel good. I know you know a lot about New Jersey and uh, and and elections there. So I was going to get into this because that kind of frames where we're at today and goes to your question of, you know, what does an independent do? You only have two choices, right? So the last question before we start giving New Jersey, because it's an extreme example to ask yourselves, right, is at the turn of the century, if you were a voter and you participated, you know, what, where was, where was the electorate in general in terms of party registration? Were there a lot of independent voters? Or did most people, they were Democrats or Republicans, right? You participated politically, you were a Democrat or a Republican, right? So skip forward to today, 45% of the electorate <coughs> self-identifies as independent. Right? I would argue a lot of them aren't actually registered independent because if you're a Democrat in a Democrat district in New York, and you want to have an effective voice, you have to register Democrats six months before the primary in order to participate. If you're a Republican in a Republican district in Georgia or somewhere else, and you want to have an effective vote, you have to register Republican. So as it relates to New Jersey, we actually filed a lawsuit, which we call you know, our, our issue setting case for our national legal strategy, <coughs> which could take decades, could fail, but I think at the end of the day, for us, for an or our organization, is one, an opportunity to educate the public, opportunity to educate the courtrooms, and really drive what's been lacking in the court, which is both the parties, as we alluded to in the Sanders case, and have a little, I talked about, I brushed on briefly in California when we had our old uh, open blanket primaries. They've had the funds, they've had the resources, they've gone into court to protect their rights for over 100 years since the primary election started. But when you're in a court, judges make decisions based on who that's, on, on what, on, on what interest does, the, does a judge make its decision? Why did you choose New, uh, New Jersey over other states to try to, we're not there yet. <laughs> and okay. What's what's the answer? It's good. We're, we're gonna get right next to there. The answer. Well, what, so. do, what do judges make their decisions based on? The Constitution. They make right. it based on the Constitution, but from what? Who frames the question? Right. <clears throat> the people filing a lawsuit. Right. The people filing the lawsuit and the defendant. Mm -hmm. Right. So political <clears throat> parties have been suing the states for over a hundred years as it relates to primary elections, defending their right as it's related to what the state's doing. But who's not represented in the courtroom? The voters. The voters. So the, the voter hasn't been adequately represented in our eyes, nor been able to assert its own rights. So let's take New Jersey, right? You have, I don't even remember the exact breakdown, but it's pretty close. I know it's 47% independent, okay, and let's say you have about, you know, 30% D and about 22%, 23% R, obviously, you have third parties and stuff in there too, but for argument's sake, the electorate, you have 30% Democrats, 23% Republicans, and 47% independents. Okay. Does anybody know how many competitive general elections you had in New Jersey, not just when we filed the case, but last year? And when I say competitive, I mean there's a 10% difference between the winner and the loser. Anybody guess the number in the entire state? We're talking about assembly, senate, you know, all the races that are generally between a Republican and Democrat. Zero. 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 X. Right. So you're a voter. You're independent, you didn't vote in the primary, show up on election day. What's the meaningfulness of your vote in the general election? How impactful can you be in a, in a general election? If you have two choices. Right. So has anybody gone into the courtroom and said, 
my right to vote isn't my right to show up and cast a ballot. And I don't like using hyperbolic examples, but just to like, you know, use a hyperbole for, for clarity, right? Okay, if I go up and I vote in North Korea, is that symbolic or is it meaningful, right? So shouldn't we be asking the courts, it's my right not to have a symbolic vote, it's my right to have a meaningful vote. So given the system that's today, I'm an independent voter. The Democratic Party goes on and on and on and on about how we have to protect the right to vote at all costs. We can't put any barriers. We can't verify that the people that are voting are citizens, right? That's their big issue when it comes to voting rights. Have they ever once said, wow, there's half of the electorate in New Jersey that only gets a symbolic vote and never gets meaningful participation in who the candidates are and, and who's going to be decided. Does anybody think that's not a big issue when it comes to your right to vote? So the question is, how do we how do we remedy that, right? When you so if forty seven percent of the population is independent, does that mean that they would rather vote for a specific candidate running under the independent party or just any third party candidate? Well that's another question, right? What's the definition of independence? Right. Yeah. Does that mean go ahead. Um, so since there's so many independents in that uh, in New Jersey and uh, because they're not specifically Democratic or Republican, but it can be kind of inferred that they might, may or may not lean towards one, one way or another, even though they say they're independent. Um, couldn't the parties argue that in order to win, win a certain uh, district or a certain seat, that they would need to have some independent support? And so some of their, um, the people who they're, their candidates may have to kind of appeal to the ideas of the independents, even if they're not fully representing them. It's an argument they can make, but what are the presumptions that you started with? The presumptions that you started with in your statement. Can't the parties argue that voters can effectively have a vote by swinging, by, by shifting their vote from the predetermined nominee of one party over the predetermined nominee of our party, right? Shouldn't those independent peons showed up to the game that me and the, us are fighting together, understand that they can pick one of the two of us, right? So the question asked is, is their right to vote by showing up on election day satisfied by being able to participate in the game when they may not like either participant? Um, since we don't have sort of proportional representation and we have sort of winner takes all districts, doesn't that kind of prohibit the successfulness of what you're saying? Because um, if we did open that up and we let every person sort of, we, we split up, we gave independence more of a voice in the beginning, um, doesn't that make it less likely for the couldn't it make it less likely for the majority person to become successful? Because the, do you know, does that make sense? Well, I, get, I, I, get what, I get what you're saying, and then also let's go back to the, the presumptions on this, okay? When America started, we said, what kind of form of government are we gonna have, right? What distinguishes our type of system from a lot of systems in Europe, for example? Are we a parliamentary system? We're not. Why did we reject, why did we reject the part? The founders didn't just wake up and say, this is how we're gonna do it. You know, they thought very long and hard about whether we would have a parliamentary system or not. But our system was designed to serve, was it designed to serve a bunch of parties and political factions? Or to serve who? The people, right? So the, the, the smallest minority or faction to be represented in the United States form of government is the individual, right? So I'll give somebody had a question. Um, but in that scenario, right, isn't weren't the founding fathers also scared of like the will of the people, like the will of the majority, the majority? So that like that's why they created like the Senate, so that means so like all states were equal in like a certain portion of it. That's exactly right, right? So we don't. So we know 
we didn't want to go to a place where we just created a whole bunch of different factions and then, end, you know, then independence would end here and another other faction. But we also didn't want to go to a pure democracy, right? Which is part of the reason why you have a, a check and a balance on that. They didn't envision political parties at all because they were worried to go back. They didn't want any political factions, and two was no better than 17, right? So, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, sorry to like change it like real briefly, but yeah. like assuming that there is a problem, mm -hmm. how would you fix it? Would you want to implement like a nonpartisan primary like we have here in California? But then, how would that eliminate the two-party system? That like, doesn't that just strengthen the democratic system, which in California, in most people here are Democrats. Mm -hmm. Like, what, doesn't that just strengthen the democratic system and then you would just pick two from the democratic system? Like, how does that incorporate independence mm -hmm. and independent candidates? Mm -hmm. You're always like two, two steps. Yeah. Um, but it's a good, that's a great question. That's exactly the questions we should be asking. I get challenges all the time. I live in an election reform world where a lot of people don't like what we did on top two because they say, well, now we only have two choices, and now you've made, you know, now we only have, now we have a super majority of Democrats. It's even worse, right? But it'll come back to the question, right, about the fundamental nature of it, right? And the question I asked earlier: Do we have a two-party system? at all costs, and is every shade of blue the same as any other shade of blue? Is a Ron Paul or Donald Trump or John McCain, are those shades of red all the same, right? So the first question I ask is, okay, you have parties, you have leadership, is how do you, how do you have accountable, uh, a structure of accountability so that when they're in office, they represent and they're held accountable by these people? Right? I promise I'll get more directly back to your question, but if you go back to New Jersey, right? You're in New Jersey and you're a legislator, and let's pick one of the two parties, just for example, for let's say you're a Republican, okay? I'm a Republican. Now, let's make some simple presumptions. There's a political narrative over here, that's the D's narrative, Pick any, pick any political issue today that's a hot topic. Voter ID laws. Voter ID. I like it. Using a voting rights issue and a voting rights issue. Tough because it actually the reason they have these positions relates to the election process itself, right? But so now look at we have this national narrative. Of, you know, we need to have voter ID. No, we can't have voter ID. That's barrier. We also have the national dialogue of foreign influence coming into our elections. Did Russia do this? Did they not do that? How did, we have all kinds of issues of national security, right? Now the Democrats have taken a position that any suggestion that we do something to securitize our election process, right, is solely can be only one by, from one thing, that you're a racist, right? Now, if you don't believe that we can't have any security by saying, I want to make sure it's citizens showing up to vote, you're now a racist. And if you're a Republican, not accepting everything the Republicans want to do, which we know a lot of it's derived out of self-interest, right? Because they'll win more elections. It's just a matter of fact that when you if you put on some of these barriers, it's going to tend to inure to the benefit of the Republican Party because you'll have less voters that tend to vote Democrat, right? Show up at the polls, right? So we know there's a self-interest embedded in the support of the Republican Party for this side. And so they take the position, though, that we want to have all these, and they overreach way over here, so that can create a division between the electorate to show, look, racists over here, people that don't believe in security over here, and want to have non-citizens affect our elections over here, right? Now, you're a Republican, right? And the legislature is going to put together something 
that's going to be a reasonable bill. It's going to balance the, the different factions. Maybe it's a small change to voter rights here, or it doesn't give the Republicans everything over here. Now, you're three months before an election, and this is your district, and you had 5% voter turnout. You have closed primaries. You're a Republican. And the people that tend to come out in this tend to be who? Who these people tend to be. Remember, the general election doesn't matter. Whoever wins this primary, hyper -partisan. they're hyper-partisan. They're the most likely to say, you have to take this position because if you don't, what happens? You uh, end up voting. Well, wait. The, 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 the the other side the you guys heard the term primary, yeah. right? You get primary. Now, go back to the money and politics issue. A lot of people talk about money. I think it's a problem. There's things you got to do about it. It's very complicated. But how often do you hear the national discourse connecting the money and politics problem to this situation? If I have $100, and I'm going to use that to affect an election that includes 50 people, how many dollars per voter do I have? Two. Two. Okay, now, say this is a state with 100 people and 50 of them vote. Okay, now let's take that state of 100 people and only 5% of them vote. How many dollars? Or how many dollars per voter do I have? 20. Okay, so basic economics. What's the valuation of my money in politics? It's 10 times greater. Now go and think about politics as a marketing business. Now you're, you're Coca-Cola, or you're, you're any brand, and you're gonna go out there and try to say, buy my Coca-Cola. Do you think it's easier if I know, well, I know you really like caffeine. I know you really like your stuff sugary. I really know all these things about you. Aren't the, are the dollars more effective or less effective when I know <coughs> everything about you? Much more effective. Much more effective, okay? These are not only 5% of the voters. We already know they don't want any compromise here and they don't want any compromise here. What's the power of money in politics now? substantially greater and now you're trying to be a this is why I believe that a lot of the angst is is misdirected at people who are actually in office sure there's good people and bad people just like everywhere else but you're here as a legislator and have to do good policy and the question you have to ask is what is the balance I make between good policy and being able to survive knowing that there's moneyed interest out there who will take me out because it's easy to take me out if I don't appeal to this electorate, right? And how good am I, how, how much am I gonna be effective if I can't survive the primary? Sure, I can stand, grandstand and sit on, you know, and take a self-righteous position for one election cycle, but then I'm done, I'm out, right? So I think the conditions of today, New Jersey is an extreme example, but it highlights, I think, the difficult nature of, of elections and how we fix the process, because it's not just voters that suffer from it, it's the legislators themselves. And can you really blame the people who go and run in a system and then get into office under the system for not representing everybody if the incentives and the accountability structure naturally lead to the situation we have today, right? So, you brought it up not too long ago, okay? So then what do you do, right? California is just, California has a super majority of Democrats now. We just had a nonpartisan system. The first thing that I will admit from the front end you know, I work with a lot with the ranked choice voting people. I work a lot with approval voting people. The first thing I, I will admit from the front end that there's a 
a lot of improvements that could be made to a top two system, right? Is it not, it's not a silver bullet that's gonna change the world. And that not only that, you have to think about besides the rules, what other constructs are set up in order to create a two-party system, or in California's case, essentially a one-party system, right? Right now, the parties are the funding vehicle. If you wanna run for office, a substantial amount of money goes through and funds it. If you're running for office and you need a political consultant, you go to the independent consultant store, how many independent consultants do you think are out there that have the experience, expertise, and connections to run your campaign if you want to be an independent? And even if they're a Democrat or a Republican in, uh, consultant, what do you think are the odds they take your campaign? Because they'll have the fear of what? Not being hired by the other campaign. Never being hired again by their party, right? You want data? You want voter data? Who do you go to to get your voter data? I think there's a lot of people out there in the independent world that are purchasing, hosting, able to manage an independent voter data, right? So you tend to, the, the, there's, nobody, is con, nobody is under the presumption that the two parties are gonna go away because you have a nonpartisan system. They still have institutional and structural advantages. The question we should go back to is the one why I articulated the case in New Jersey. Were the incentives aligned? California now, I'm a Democrat. Okay, let's just take a, let's take a case, I'm a Democrat in a 50% D district, 25% I, 25% R. Okay, question one. Under a traditional system, New Jersey style system. Okay, absent some miracle, who who wins this race? Democrat. Democrat. Didn't take you guys long to make to answer that. At what point in this race does an independent or a Republican have an effective vote? A meaningful vote? When does they ever matter? So what is the incentive for this Democrat assembly person, congressperson, to represent this 50% of the electorate? Where's their incentive, other than pure goodwill? None. It doesn't matter. They don't. In fact, they have a what? They have a disincentive. Because they have to go and run in a primary with these 50% of voters, right? They're literally, the incentives are drawn against the public interest to act like Nonpartisan public officials. And because the people who vote in primaries are more partisan, then they're going to be very much opposed to any efforts to help the other. That's right. So now let's go to a nonpartisan system. Not perfect. Party leadership's going to have a lot of determination over it. Now we have a nonpartisan primary. Round one. I get this all the time. People go, you have two Democrats in the, in the general election. Now you have no choice. You have two Republicans in the general election. Now you have no choice. Okay. So let's, let's accept top two is not perfect. Let's accept traditional systems aren't perfect. And let's talk about can we make something a little bit better than it was before. Right? This district would likely outcome in, in what kind of a race in the November election? Will it be a Democrat on Democrat, independent on Democrat? How, how do you think Probably, Democrat. Probably gonna end up as a Democrat on Democrat. So you'll have some D's competing here, and you'll have some I's, and then you'll have a couple Republicans, but most likely it's gonna go here. So now you have a general election, It's D on D. Just a matter of game theory. Who wins this election? The Democrat, if you look in a blue world, in a, in a blue, red and blue world, right? But now you have two blues. One of the blues got to win. So the question is, what shade wins? Right? 
does the Bernie Sanders or does the Joe Biden or does the Donald Trump or the John McCain or whoever, there's lots of, if we stop looking at elected officials, like we stop trying to look at people and say, oh, you're just a Democrat, I know everything about you, or you're just a Democrat elected official, so I know everything about you, and allow elected officials to be people just like the rest of us, instead of just another player on the party's team, we can see that hopefully there'll be different types. And in the general election, where are the incentives for these Democrats? We already know they split up most of the vote here in the primary. That's their base. Who wins? Um, but does it, so I guess my question from earlier is, since you have sort of this winner takes all system, mm -hmm. doesn't that sort of disadvantage the independence by having what you're drawing on the board because if you have Democrat and Republican, it's sort of a broad way to organize sort of the maximum a large number of people. So if the assumption is, is that at least part or if not most of the 25% independent would lean Republican um, instead of being the that would help them be at least more represented than dividing their vote in the primary, ultimately leading to two Democrats being with right, I think there's two parts that are the ultimate, but go back to the, the beginning of that, right? Is we brought up the issue of factionalism and the parliamentary system of dividing people, right? So embedded there is, is, an, is a presumption of factionalism, right? It's the presumption that independents have to get form a tribe together, have a nominee that represents them. And you have a factionalism, you have a faction-based government where the independent represents independents, the Democrat represents the Democrats, right? Challenge the presumption and may and let's assume that a Democrat is capable of representing more Republicans and more Democrats because we're looking at an individual and that yeah, maybe an independent or Republican this isn't going to be their perfect candidate, but the Democrats incentivized to say, you know, they're making a pretty good ar argument about market fairness, or they're making a pretty good five minutes already. Damn. <laughs> they're making a good argument about market fairness, or they're making a good argument about the rights of independent voters, or something else, right? And so, do we create a, a system? Or the legislator that ultimately has to serve in this office and then be all accountable to do this again is now incentivized not just to represent the blue team, but to also recognize the merit in the reasons and the perspectives of why some people chose another team. Because now they're going to win. Now you say, well, that's crazy, that's never going to happen. In Dem on Dem and Republican on Republican races, I know we have a question here and there. But on those races, one important statistic, over 60% of the time, the candidate not endorsed by the party. So think about that. If they don't have the endorsement, they don't get the money. They don't go on the slates. They don't get any of the support. Over 60% of the time in the blue state of California, in a Democrat and Democrat race, the non-endorsed candidate has won. Right? So we can say we have a super majority of legislators in California, which is true, that they tend to be put moving one direction, which is all true. But there is both a lot of officials in there that have gotten elected by rejecting the party line position, one, and we've also created the conditions for that to spread. And so if we look at the gameplay as not being a battle between the Democrats and the Republicans, but rather a battle between the Democrats and everybody else that wants to have nonpartisan leadership, the, the, the playing field is still more equal. It just might, might not be represented in the traditional way by the color of the jerseys that they're wearing. But do you have a question on that? Did you? Uh, I did oh, How does this compare to rank choice voting? Three minutes left. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean you if, get. what you're saying, if what you're saying is true, wouldn't right. ranked choice, choice voting be more effective because then you're really taking into account the different shades of voters? I'll try to run through this as fast as I love this question. It's a good one to end on, right? 
ranked choice voting gives you more opportunity to express the level of your preferences. Right? Do you all know what ranked choice voting is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I never find a room that <laughs> many people. I'm impressed. Okay, so it gives you an opportunity to range of choice preferences, but the basis of it, you can have ranked choice voting in a partisan based system with 5% turnout electing who those people you get to choose from, right? You still have a partisan and faction based system, right? So I'm not saying that because I think ranked choice voting is bad. I'm saying that, that they, they, they're solving two different issues. Ranked choice is to solve a spoiler effect in your ability to determine between candidates. Nonpartisan primaries are solving the problem of accountability and who's determining the field in the first place, right? So I'll leave with this. Independent Voter Project passed a nonpartisan primary. We're participating in, in the, the lawsuits against the Commission on Presidential Debates. We're doing a lot of um, other stuff. But by virtue of the work Kai is doing and we're all doing together of bringing these organizations to a national table, the Independent Voter Project board just voted to start pursuing moving from a top two system to a top four system and guess what you need to do in the general election so that you ensure majority rule, right? Ranked choice voting. So that, that is li literally where we're at now. It's just first starting the construct. So questions? You heard it here first. <laughs> you really did, because we haven't even, yeah. Um, what do you think the best, like, it seems like California. If you want to, if you want to promote the idea of, of non, uh, of more independence and voting, it would be to expand like legislation across the U.S. instead of like improving. Basically, like if California is going to become more liberal with this, would it make more sense to have states like Colorado or other states ex accept the jungle primary idea or the or the, the the top two shows? <laughs> yeah. Louisiana's jungle friend. Uh, so, yeah, yes. And the thing that's important to understand from a constitutional perspective is states have wide latitude to determine how they do their elections. States also are embedded with their own history, their own circumstances, right? There are so many different variables that you really have to take it state by state. Now, can you learn from other states and, and change? I mean, California learned from Washington State, who Frankly, California couldn't have gotten here because of our circumstances, including the fact that Washington had already done it and the Supreme Court said it was okay. But why was Washington able to pass the top two in the first place? It's because Washington's <coughs> experience, their voters never registered by party, right? There was, there was no party registration in Washington. So it's not nearly a bigger concept for them to go to a nonpartisan primary. They didn't have party registration in the first place. Only because of that history and that experience, and then California having opened a primary and then having the Supreme Court say, no, the Democratic Party says you can't do that, by the way. Democratic Party, ruling by Justice Scalia, says you have to close your primary. Did we draw from that experience in order to create a top two primary in California, right? Colorado is going to be different. Colorado actually is doing a ton of stuff right now. They just went to a semi-open primary because they believed that was the step they could take towards progress. They just uh, had gerrymandering or they had gerrymandering reform. Um, they're doing a lot of stuff in Colorado. Maine just adopted ranked choice voting. We were a big part of the educational effort on that. Each state has a different pathway to improve the system. None of those pathways are going to be perfect. We're all going to have disagreements over the perfect solution, but the point is right now, and these groups coming together is exactly what you said. How do we strategize knowing we don't have an institution like the Democratic or the Republican Party? How can we build a vehicle that carries that institutional knowledge throughout the states so that the people on the ground and understand the history and the temperature and, and where you can go in those states can actually be successful when at the end of the day, you're going up against both machines, not just one.